So again, welcome everyone to DIY Zine Basics. Um, I'm Amanda Deberly at the Benton, and I'm joined by um, Graham Stinnett and Rhonda Kaufman. Um, so I wanna thank our presenters for joining us today. Um, I'm gonna introduce them so you can learn a little bit more about them um, and then turn things over um, to Graham and Rhonda. Um, Graham Stinnett is an archivist overseeing the human rights and alternative press collections at the Yukon Library, Archives and Special Collections. He holds an MA in Archival Studies from the University of Winnipeg, University of Manitoba, and a BA in History from the University of Manitoba. Graham's work focuses on the archivist as activist and expanding access to archives for a diverse audience. He's the host of Darkiv, an archives radio show and podcast, as well as curator of the Traveling Punk Rock Archives exhibition, Live at the Anthrax, Connecticut's Hardcore History. Graham currently teaches undergraduate courses on archives, memory, and popular culture. So, Welcome, Graham. It's so great to be partnering with you uh, again today. Um, Rhonda Kaufman is a metadata management librarian who manages metadata necessary for the discovery, access, and stewardship of Yukon Library collections. Previously, she worked as metadata librarian at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and metadata catalog librarian at Lehigh University. She is also an adjunct professor at Northampton Community College in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where she teaches a course in library technical services. Rhonda holds a Master of Science in Library and Information Science from Long Island University's Palmer School of Information Science. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from UConn and is very happy to return to her alma mater as a member of the library. Her research interests include diversity, equity, and inclusion in library collections and technical services and zine librarianship. So welcome Rhonda, and I'll turn things over to, to you two. Thanks very much, Amanda. Uh, thanks everyone as well for joining us and spending your uh, afternoon lunch hour getting to hopefully play with some uh, crafty, sort of DIY way of self-expressing yourself, um, but also kind of engaging with a format that is typically about this kind of underground subculture, which um, the Benton, as well as the Archives and Special Collections currently have exhibits uh, about. Um, just to kind of give you a sort of backstory, Rhonda and I are gonna give a little bit of a introduction to how we got into zines. And then we're gonna kind of work through a couple of formats. Um, zines range in size of course and from the sort of intellectual version to this is a quick sort of therapeutic creative uh, format that you can really play around with nothing is very too serious a lot of times with zines and then lastly we will kind of show how you can get engaged into the zine making kits uh, that we have at the library um, so for myself, I started in 2004 working at a sort of collective bookstore that mostly had a lot of leftist uh, anarchist principles in how they shared and exchanged information. Um, bartering with zines was a big part of how they operated the kind of resupply of the shelves in these spaces and how folks could kind of get themselves into a marketplace almost. Um, without being a traditional publisher. So in 2004 in Minneapolis, I started with several friends to kind of make zines, collect zines and uh, circulate zines. So that's kind of how I got into it. How about you, Rhonda? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm, so I started off with zines uh, in the nineties. My friend, uh, I remember I was over her house. It was probably around the time uh, that uh, yeah, like mid nineties or something like that, uh, 93 maybe. And um, she was like, dude, let's make some zines. And we were reading zines. She had, her, she had gotten a friend who had 
um, started getting her into zines. And I think she had read about them in Sassy magazine, if you remember Sassy. Um, and then we started making zines. And this was, I lived here and I went to EO Smith. We were at EO Smith uh, together. And then we started making zines together. And we used to photocopy our zines across the street at this stop, a copy shop called Stop, Copy and Run. That was like probably the store 24 complex. And then uh, I went to Yukon and we were still making zines. Um, and then I left the area for 20 years. And then uh, I started back, I made, in library school, I found zines again in libraries because I was at, uh, doing an internship at Barnard College and they have a zine collection. And um, I was like, this is a thing and you can be a zine librarian, this is really cool. So using zines as, uh, collecting zines in libraries and archives as primary resource materials and capturing like these movements and social and political movements and this genre and format of creating um, publications and self-publications was pretty cool. And then I started making zines again when I had my kid. Um, I was looking for uh, authentic birth stories um, that, was, that weren't so like hippie love everything's happy I wanted like the real stuff so I started collecting some mama zines that way um yeah and then that's how I ended up coming here and we were like hey let's start a zine a circulating zine collection so we did that thanks for that uh so full disclosure as well um part of the archives collection is is this sort of large uh, amorphous underground printing subculture collection called the Alternative Press Collection. Um, it kind of traces itself back to the late 1960s when a lot of students on campuses were getting together to do what is referred to as kitchen table press, where folks would kind of bring their editorial content, images, artwork, um, sort of show reviews, things going on in the subcultures that they were a part of to then mock up, you know, what would turn out to be a newspaper of some kind, something that's going to fit kind of the format of a standard long fold newspaper. Um, so the origin of creating material here on campus, which the newspaper here on campus was called the Yukon Free Press, and many other kinds of DIY publications have been created since then. Uh, but the sort of collecting in which the archives is involved in to represent that kind of medium of people speaking more or less for themselves, for their community, uh, and representing themselves in a way that is kind of unvarnished, typically not censored for a mainstream that had previously left them out of the conversation or out of the discourse. Um, and one of those collections I'm thankful to be able to say is the Rhonda Kaufman zine collection. Uh, which we have included in Days and Nights of uh, Print and Punk. So please check out the exhibit, not just to kind of uh, see the sort of raw product, but also some of Rhonda's amazing collections and kind of recognizing the networks in which zinesters operate to kind of escape the publisher's domain, as well as thinking about barter as being a key source in sharing information and sort of creative product. So with that in mind, uh, just as a little sort of aside, Rhonda and I want to make sure that it's kind of known um, that the Yukon Library and the Archives and Special Collections have kind of worked together to create this concept of a uh, what's called liberated uh, zine zone that we have in the uh, level B of Babbage right now. And we can tell you a little bit more at the end of the session about how you can contribute to a circulating collection of zines that we have here at the library. Um, but I have thrown into the chat as well our web page that kind of gives you the A to Z how to go make zines at the library, what zines we have in the collection, where the spaces are in the library to kind of get involved with scene making. Um, we have several sort of entry points, but today's workshop is going to kind of be what does the zine look like, how do you kind of go about compiling it, folding it, etc. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of the, the goal of today's workshop. So I'll kick it back over to Rhonda to then give us a sense of one of the first formats we're gonna talk about. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks. Um, so actually, uh, I think what I, uh, one point I wanted to add too is that I think what's really important too with zines is that sense of community and that um, 
right? Being outside, like you mentioned being outside of that mainstream publishing realm. And these were where creators really have con total control of the entire process from uh, writing and design and layout to publication and distribution of it. And those root networks are really important in, in creating this community. And, and you can also thinking about uh, the aspect of anonymity. So for groups that are, if they're writing about things or uh, that could get them in trouble legally, for instance, or they just wanna write under a different persona, there is that kind of air of, of um, anonymity that I think is important in, in the zine world. Um, I know like lots of folks have different persona um, <laughs> when it comes to what kind of zine they're writing. Um, it's pretty interesting. I'm gonna share my screen here and I have a document camera and I've got some um, zines coming up. So this is um, one of our, our zines for our liberated zine zone here at um, Homer and Babbage Library. Um, this is a free zine that we have plopped all over um, the level B um, area where we have our circulating collection of zines. And, and they act just like any other sort of I resource in the library, you can check it out. Um, it's in the leisure reading room. Um, and it has some, um, some instructions and some information on how you can, a little bit more about zines. So like this, uh, what is a zine? Um, some information about a zine, uh, about the collection using zines and scholarship, right? how we had said talking about uh, using zines as primary so, uh, source material. So you can actually do research on them. A lot of the zines that we have um, include personal narratives or they document social uh, events and movements, um, so they could be good in research. Um, and again, um, yeah, this gives you a little bit more information about that. One thing that we're going to look at too is um, looking at how we make zines today, right? So if that link that, the, uh, that um, Graham had shared um, has a link to this uh, online viewable version of this zine, this Wicked, wicked Meta <laughs> number two, a zine about zines. So this is really kind of like what you wanna use when we're thinking about doing workshops or, or making zines. So again, this has a lot of information that's in the other zine, but if we look um, into how to make zines, so first we'll need your supplies and we're looking at sort of the layout here. This is a larger format zine and it's a half size. Um, the previous one I had showed you, shown you before was a quarter size zine. So we're looking at um, this kind of layout. So a half size zine is you take a normal sheet of paper like this and we fold it in half. But we need to lay it out. So um, the method um, by which people were um, making copies of these and sending them out was through uh, at photocopiers. Or now I guess you could scan pages in on a photocopier on your phone. And then what I tend to do is I send them to UPS and then they print them out for me double-sided. Um, but um, this um, zine tells you a little bit more information about how to make a zine. Um, in different formats. And also, um, and for this instance here, how to make a mini zine, Graham's gonna show a little demo of this in a few minutes. But we also have um, information on how to do um, digital zine design. So this zine itself was created in PowerPoint of all things. And I created my own template um, of, uh, in PowerPoint. And it's really easy to just drop, plop uh, your text and insert your images onto a slide uh, and you change the size of your slide uh, to accommodate um, the actual page. So you want your sheet size for a, a letter uh, zine to be eight and a half by 11. And then you kind of put in little garters to make your template. And then you could just really plop as you want. Um, and what we have back here too, is the pagination. So when we're actually printing from the digital uh, way to actually do a double-sided photocopy, you have to really pay attention to the pagination here. So you're gonna have like one page, it'll be the front and then the uh, uh, opposite, uh, the verso of that will be page two and then page three. Um, I have an example of some zines like in the different stages of creation that I'd like to show you here too. So here is my zine that I created when I was talking about before about my birth story. This is the finished pro pro 
product. And this is actually, we have a call number on here and there's a barcode. So this is coming from my, uh, from the circulating collection, right? But, so this is a quarter size zine. So this is compared to the half size. So you can see on one sheet of paper, I have um, four, basically four pages here. And so you have to cut the, the pages in half and then do double-sided copy. And that gets you a quarter sizing. When I'm doing it on one sheet of paper, this is the actual, what we call the zine flat. So this is what it looks like um, from the beginning. Um, this is completely cut and paste. And I just like cut this, I had some kind of cardboard thing and I um, cut out text on uh, from Word and then literally glue it onto my pieces of paper. And so I arranged this so that we have the cover here. And then when you flip it over on this side, here's my page two. And then I, I do the pagination. So then we have to do page three underneath it and then page four. So you kind of have to pay attention to the pagination and there are some templates online. If you go to our LibGuide, it'll kind of show you um, the templates that you can use and, and how to arrange the, the pagination so that it kind of makes sense. I'm not gonna lie, you'll probably mess up the first time you do it because that's totally what I do all the time. But you know, that's what zine making is, you're gonna mess up. So then afterwards I print it out and here is my photocopied pieces of paper. This one is all black and white. So then we have to cut it halfway here. And then we get our zine like this and it's our individual pages. And then we fold it and staple it down the middle. That's kind of a low down and dirty way of doing a quarter size zine. One other version of the zine that I think Graham is going to show you is how to make a super cute one page zine like this. And this is a zine that is in our collection. And this came um, about right around the coronavirus when it started. And this is comic just for kids. And it kind of tells you a little bit about coronavirus in a very easy way for kids to kind of understand, right? Like, oh my God, what is this? Wow, do we have coronavirus? And then it's just telling kids how to wash your hands often. What does it mean? Um, it can affect anybody, right? So kind of a public service announcement, but in a fun, easily acceptable way and cheap way. So if we unfold this, it's just really from one sheet of paper, one copy paper. And the way we fold it and arrange it, it turns into one zine like that. So one sheet of paper can be arranged and made into, again, one zine. All right, I think that's good for me, um, Graham. What do you think? Yeah, thanks, Rhonda. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, one thing too to kind of note, and this kind of gets back to maybe the history of people using different kinds of mediums and technology to create the zine. As you saw there when Rhonda was showing Bloom, you know, she's starting with the colored image. So like the flowers themselves, originally are colorful, they pop, it's glossy, but by the time you get it onto, at least in the 80s and 90s, 1980s and 90s, when you usually only had a black and white photocopy machine, something that isn't as high contrast as say black text on white paper, um, you start to get a lot of that gray bleed where the color starts to kind of lose itself in a way. Um, and then similarly with that really fantastic uh, illustrated coronavirus zine, you know, that exists in a, in a sort of current color printing. Um, you know, you're able to use a lot more of the resources of technology today, whereas say back in the 1930s, when people were making fanzines about say like science fiction or creative writing, they're typing it all out on a typewriter in black on whatever color paper like a big a big element of like the accent typically comes from the color paper that you're using instead of 
the color ink that is printing the object itself. So if you look back historically in the collections that we have going all the way back to that period, um, you know, the machine itself that's doing the printing has almost as much of an impact on how the object looks when it comes out. Mimeograph machines, you know, they typically come out in a purple. Um, that's more from the 70s and 60s. But now that we have the sort of freedom to build things in PowerPoint, give it a lot of color and actually print as almost easily in color, um, there's a lot more uh, creative sort of ability to, to draw on what we have. Um, and I also wanted to comment on the mini that Rhonda shared about the coronavirus, you know, like those are very simple drawings and I can't get anywhere near that with my own skills. So the goal of the zine is to kind of be, um, work with whatever your creative aspect allows. And like, of course, don't be intimidated by any of that, but um, I myself know that I would not be able to even draw at that degree. So I would lend from images, you know, things that I had found in magazines, uh, newspapers, cutting things out. Here we go. Uh, yes. <laughs> These are your daughters, I'm assuming. And uh, yeah, so you can kind of see that, you know, there's a range in which the form itself can just lend itself to what the, what the output is supposed to be. Um, so I want to share my screen so I can kind of show you something that is similarly in line with um, kind of what I want to do with a zine, which is as an archivist working in an academic library in this sort of super niche field, but also being interested in zines, um, we have a pretty strong um, archival collection of Civil War based research materials, you know, originally from the period of the mid 19th century. Uh, it ranges from diaries to uh, some, you know, photo format. Uh, collections, but also um, monographs that have some pretty significant contributions of photography in print. Uh, we have nursing records about caring for, you know, the soldiers of that time. Um, basically a very traditional archival collection. Uh, papers, right, like doing deep research in uh, how people are like handwriting letters about their experiences in, say, um, Virginia during the war. Well, my goal was to try and take what sometimes is perceived as maybe a very stuffy topic and give it a little bit more of an analog, um, tradable, you know, kind of get this out in a social media-esque way, but still adhering to maybe a form that has a bit of a undercurrent of um, doing it yourself. So I created what I'm calling the Yukon Civil War Archive Do-It-Yourself uh, Civil War Research Pamphlet. And again, it is a mini zine. So it's based from one piece of paper uh, that has then given me eight wonderful, extremely small um, pages to try and jam pack what is maybe like a hundred linear feet of primary research materials on the Civil War that we have here at the Yukon Archives. So as you can see, I'm kind of lending from um, digital by incorporating QR codes that I've just grabbed from Google Chrome, copied that QR code into a Word document, um, grabbed little pieces of text that I sort of typed out as the citation of the object or the collection that I'm drawing from. Some of our collections have digital, digitized photography in them that you can find uh, online on our um, digital archive, copying those, incorporating them, citing where I can, you know, trying to be as uh, above board as possible, but also just trying to get across the fact that, hey, we've got a lot of stuff relating to this topic and it can be um, sort of promoted in very non-traditional formats. So as Rhonda was showing you, you know, this basically comes out as a single page form. And again, this is the copy, right? So Rhonda had just showed you the original document that was used to cut and paste, create. This is similarly a copy of the original to then make this format. Here is what the uh, original looks like. So as you can see, it's everything from, uh, I think a sticker that I got from the Alumni Foundation that I, 
cut up. I, I have a whole bunch of Civil War related like magazines that I was able to cut apart. You know, a big part of zine making too is really drawing on um, the litter of the publishing world, <laughs> trying to like basically dig through, uh, you know, boxes of old magazines or going to flea markets. I, I've done a few workshops for some student organizations where the folks would bring in parcels of magazines that they found for cheap or for free uh, in their garage or just lying about, so to speak. Um, and several other student groups are kind of in the process of making zines. I know WHUS makes a zine pretty regularly. The Yukon Free Press has made zines occasionally over its existence. Um, so it's really great to see folks drawing on this sort of very classic format, but building it in ways that are both electronic, but also um, analog. So one of the interesting things that you can do with the one page, and I'm going to kind of show you just how to, how to do the fold of it, but when you have a single page like this, you can start to really figure out where's the leeway to doing a little bit more design in a larger space. And that's typically where the folds happen. So just uh, by way of example, uh, similarly, the sort of pagination is a big part of thinking through this concept of the single page mini, um, where in this instance, you know, the way that the folds come out, pages six and seven, are going to be a larger two page spread and pages four and five here are also going to be a two page spread. So that allows you to do things like this, where in this little section, you know, I'm able to kind of bleed across the page long phrases or pack in more stuff to kind of give it a little bit of a larger um, sort of plate to work on. And you can work on these in different capacities. You know, you can go page by page and just kind of like intricately build each one, or you can fold it out and begin working on it after you have kind of done the folding. So I'm kind of showing you the backwards to the beginning, uh, but let's now do some folding to get a sense of kind of how to how to make this. Um, and again, in the liberated zine zone zine that is on our libguide, um, you can kind of follow those steps. And there are countless videos uh, on YouTube that you can use to, to do this very thing. Um, so we're gonna start by making the single page by folding uh, hamburger style. So we're gonna go end to end there. And one thing that is a real benefit when you are doing any of this like smaller sort of zine format making is a bone folder. I know this is like a very uh, conservator library adjacent weapon uh, of choice, but anything with a flat edge is also really great. Like using the edge of the stapler you might end up using, you know, is really great to just get that crease down. You really want to make sure that this is a nice crispy edge because it's really going to help your pages kind of conform by the time you get to the very end otherwise it's going to be you know and that's fine it can be like kind of splayed out um but for perfectionists find yourself a nice uh flat tool um then we're going to go uh, hot dog style sorry let me do it for the camera that way we're going to go end over end this direction get that crisp fold going and then we're going to fold into the middle from each side to get a quarter of the page into a fold like that. You just want to meet them up in the middle on both sides. Thusly. It's nice being a hand model, huh, Rhonda? Um, okay, and then by the time you've got this folded into these these eight pages, um, you're then going to want to go in and make your sort of hinge for the whole object. And you're going to want to take a pair of scissors, which is in the lovely zine kit that we have compiled that you can check out at the Maker Studio uh, in the library. You want to basically bring, again, hamburger style bring the ends together and find this fold that has been made on both sides. And you're gonna basically cut to that last quarter without going over. You don't really wanna get into that other side, otherwise the fold 
um, might sort of start to take over in different parts of it. So we're gonna get as close to the end as possible to then get like this, this sort of mouse creature. Um, yeah, and that quack, is, quack, 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 quack. yes, you quack, want it to, quack. Howard the Duck, I'm thinking right here. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then you basically kind of bring it together to then make your eight page zine. Ta-da. One of the things that you also want to make sure you do once you kind of get it back to that point. So again, got this, we're folding those ends to each other to then make kind of like a plus sign. Um, you want to look for where the edges of each page are kind of together. So like in this format, it's a little bit unstable. You've got openings here on the ends, but if you try and get it to where the top does not come apart, you have an easier chance of kind of keeping the thing together to start building. Um, and again, this is where like the crispy fold is really gonna help. So if you go back with your bone folder or whatever you have to just make sure you're getting everything really tight, then it feels like you have a pretty um, significant object to start kind of working with. And again, when you do this, you're gonna be building a flat version that has all of this really heavy sort of craft stuff on top of it. If you're going in this sort of analog way where you're putting stickers on and stamps and all that kind of stuff, this then will go to a printer or you will scan this and make a digital version of it to then be printed somewhere else. So hopefully your concept of like making the zine is also part of trading the zine and like showing it to people. And a lot of that tends to be this, this sort of copy version of it or contributing it to say a circulating zine collection at the Yukon Library. But uh, getting this thing in its final product is ultimately gonna be from the original. And then once you copy it once, you can kind of scatter it to the wind uh, from there. But the original is something you kind of always want to hold on to, at least from an archivist's perspective. Um, so that is kind of my um, bit on the, the mini zine. I now want to jump to what we have in the zine maker kit, um, which is, and maybe this will be better on my normal camera, but things like scissors, the glue stick, the Sharpie. Um, we also have a whole bunch of kind of, pri not primary source, but like guides that we have started to collect for the archives and for the circulating collection. Um, one of those books is called The Stolen Sharpie Revolution. And it is very much about the primacy of these kinds of craft analog tools that help you more or less build the guts of the zine, so things like alphabet stickers, um, washi tapes, things that can kind of give you a nice little border, something to kind of accent the material that you've got. Uh, papers, various kinds of paper, craft paper. Um, you know, we purchase these to then have a supply on hand and we regularly kind of re-up what supplies are within the zine maker kit. Um, paper, of course, is one of those things, you know, being able to just have access to stuff to cut apart and make um, interesting designs to then usually go over the top of that with the content that you've got. Um, we also have uh, letter stamps that go with the stamp pads to kind of like build out a little bit more of what the text is that you have. Um, we have a Dymo label maker, which is very excellent um, and very retro. Folks get a good kick out of that. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen just to kind of show you then the crate itself and kind of talk a little bit about where you can find these things. So this is the zine maker kit itself. Uh, it is self-contained. It has these materials within it. Um, we kind of have like three entry points for how you can go about finding this kit and doing things with it, like making zines. Uh, the first is we house one of these at the Yukon Library's Maker Studio, um, which again, you can find through the link that I sent about the zine lib guides. Uh, they have operating hours. So if you're a student who is interested in wanting to make a zine yourself with this material, 
be sure to go to that web page first. Um, you can just Google Yukon uh, Maker Studio and they have hours where you can go in, um, draw on these materials, come back, you know, work with the material as you'd like. Where there's a typewriter there as well, if you're interested in knowing kind of the analog hand key functions of how folks used to make zines. Um, that's one place to do that. Another place then is if you are a student group and you are interested in kind of having a session, uh, Rhonda and I would also be available to potentially do a workshop with you, but then allow you to kind of uh, borrow the kit if you would like for a short period. And then for faculty, if there's any faculty or any students who want to like pitch zine making to your faculty, um, we loan out a, a kit itself for up to two weeks. Um, for your class to kind of do your own zine making. And, you know, it's difficult sometimes to kind of get those classes done or a zine done in like the 50 minute block that you've got. So that's why we allow it to be out for about two weeks at a time. And then ultimately the goal that Rhonda and I really have for like the zine zone is promoting this concept of sort of DIY student created products such as zines about your group or about your own personal interests or even as a class project that can then be copied and contributed back to the circulating collection and the archives itself. You know, the records that students create um, from their own perspective is one of these things that the archives is very actively always trying to collect and contribute to this historical collection that we have about students and student experience, um, politics on campus, music that you're listening to, that kind of thing. And we can then make a copy or you can upload a digital copy um, and send it to either of us and we will contribute that to the circulating collection. Rhonda has a pretty substantial um, set of experiences in order to create circulating metadata for those zines that re-enter the library proper to make this like an official object that you can literally put into an academic research library's collection. Um, and for those who are looking to like publish, that's it. <laughs> that's gonna like the easiest way to get into um, a library collection as far as just kind of a quick startup uh, collection that we're trying to build right now. Rhonda, any um, additional pieces of advice or information you wanted to share? Uh, yeah, I mean, from my perspective as a uh, the cataloger of all the things, um, these are totally legitimate research materials. And I'm cataloging them in WorldCat like I would any other library material, and I'm creating name authority records. So I have a name authority record in Library of Congress name authority file so that um, as an author of zines, and I'm doing this for the publishers and other creators. Um, the circulating zine collection at UConn is kind of, a, it's a very general, it's a, in terms of collecting scope, it kind of is an example of, we try to collect examples of all kinds of zines. So we have zines in different sizes and topics, um, including um, those personal, kind of stories, but also there's DIY things like how to crochet. Um, and then there's some um, uh, art zines. Uh, we've had donations from an art class here where an assignment was to make a, a, a zine and uh, two copies were donated to Yukon, one for the to live in the archives and one to live in the circulating zine collection. And those are all there. And they're all in the library catalog as well. Um, yeah, so they are totes legit. Um, I kind of wanted to share my screen if that's okay. I just, I was just kind of thinking about what you were saying about um, artwork and before my mic wasn't quite working. Um, so these <laughs> zines I pulled out, I forgot I had these. I was looking at my kind of like, teaching um, folders, my zine teaching folders. And I found these were zines that my kid made when they were little, little, little. This is the first one where um, before they could write. And when I would take those one pager zines, like just blanks, I'd fold up pieces of paper and put them in my bag with uh, crayons and markers or whatever. And we'd go places 
and like to a restaurant or and a and you know the kid wants to do something so I'm like here honey why don't you make a make a zine make a book and so this is one where they were just tr trying to form a, like trying to get the uh, person form and then they would tell me the story to and I would write it out for them and so this is a picture of me carrying the baby and I guess I don't look very happy um and then more, this is us walking and stuff. So, and then like they had messed up with the, the format because they're kids and like, why not? Um, and so then that was them signing their name because I was like, this is your publication. You published this, I'm gonna make photocopies of it. And so can you sign your, your work? And they're very excited about that. And then this is another one um, once they did start writing and they were really started making comics. So as an entry point, a three-year-old can make a zine and really in terms of an activity that lets them feel like they have accomplished something and, and these little books for kids, it's like their own publication. And I did go and make copies. And then they have these um, places where you can buy zines or like zine fest and, and um, book shows and things like that. There was the Boston Feminist Scene Fest, which is just like this place where um, you can, where a zine store is table and you can sell your zines to anybody who wants to come by. Um, I went there, I was tabling and selling some of my zines and uh, I said, hey Z, why don't you make, well, I'll make you some copies of your zines and why don't you, you can go around and trade for other zines for people. So there are these zine stores um, watching this little like, you know, six-year-old kid walking around like, can I trade my zine? And they're like, oh my God, yeah, totally. That's like the most adorable thing ever. So yeah, it was really awesome. But so like the sense of self-confidence that it gives, I think kids too, and I think anybody, um, it's very, it's a very um, positive experience, I think in terms of creation and having ownership of the entire thing and, and creating that community. It's, special. Was there something else we wanted to show? Um, I think that was it as far as what, yeah, what we wanted to get across in terms of the, how to make them, how to find them. Um, you know, the goal overall is to engage students with just zine making and see themselves in the zines and uh, be able to kind of learn from each other's experiences in this format. Uh, again, it's kind of like trying to do social media, but in a more constructive, non-word limit capacity. And then also, you know, be able to kind of bring these things in and out of an academic space, toss them to the wind, who finds them randomly. Sometimes that's always like one of the best ways to encounter new ideas. Um, and unfortunately, just even you mentioning like, yes, the Zine Fest is now kind of one of the only places, um, just thinking about the bookshop that I started at, has long been gone, kind of like the, you know, the same thing about like women's bookstores are just mm -hmm. always on the decline. Places to kind of find information like this is always under attack. Libraries are always under attack. <laughs> and so this is a, a way to kind of bolster um, collections and bringing your information into that sort of socially decided important space. So hopefully that's yeah. somewhat inspiring. I think there's, isn't there like a New Haven Zine Fest happening next weekend? There is, yeah, one of the contributors that we bring zines in from is going to be tabling at it. So mm -hmm. stuff's out there. I just cataloged there, two new zines, yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad they made it. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, well, if, if we maybe have some time for questions, if anybody has any, um, Amanda, I don't know if you want to regulate that or uh, anything that's in the chat, um, we're happy to answer. Yeah, if anybody has a question, um, you could just throw them in the chat and uh, I'll read them out here. I want to go to Star Wars, Amanda. I'm trying to think what uh, <laughs> what is the what's the zine film that we show, Rhonda? It's got to be like. I don't know what it. Yeah, something something from that period, but I like that you're, you're twinning a film with your exhibit. That's a great idea. Yeah, it, 
I'll I'll give the credit to our guest co-curator Allison Paul. Um, but that that should be a lot of fun. Um, although you know, very very intense just in terms of of uh, um, all the licensing and stuff for sure. Oh, yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah. So um, we have a couple of questions um, from Charlene. Are there any issues with copyright, trademark, et cetera, when you're using existing publications? Yeah, I think definitely um, in terms of within copyright, there are some things that you can do within, um, uh, I'm blanking on the term. Graham. Fair use. Fair use, thank you. Um, and that if you kind of borrow an image, but then repurpose it and, and kind of, you know, slap the mustache on it, it's like the new, um, a new form of art. But then also if you're looking for like general, just like click art, clip art type of things, it's, it's a good idea to, if you're looking online to look for that, um, the ones that are, uh, have no copy or like um, fair, that are fair use um, and like I'm trying to think of the places that you can go. Library of Congress has a lot of um, fair use and um, images without copyright or that are within the public domain um, and Flickr common for sure. Um, and if you look for any sort of the um, do a search for like copyright free or public domain images, um, you can totally and freely use those in your work. If you're cutting out like weirdo images from like magazines and stuff, like for like backgrounds and things, that's generally totally okay. And then a lot of the zines too that we get intentionally identify themselves somewhere kind of where you would find the front matter or the back. Um, will have the little icon that says like, this is copy left, sort of like the opposite of copyright, which allows anyone fair use to copy, redistribute, um, destroy whatever they want to do yeah. with that. Um, and so think about that, even when you're, when you're considering the zine that you make and its officialness, you can kind of give it an officialness that is intentionally undermining maybe the um, officialness that we're all rebelling against. Mm -hmm or creative commons, there's different versions of the creative commons, and you can state that explicitly on your thing, depending on, on what you feel comfortable with. That's a um, question. Thank you. Um, we had another question um, from Bellica. If, uh, if you all talked about how to get a zine added to the liberated zine zone. Yeah, totally. There's a, actually a donation box in uh, right next sitting next to the shelving uh, and level bean um, Babbage where you can just plop in a copy or you can email us we're at zines at our uh, edu. we'll type it in the chat um, yeah we can send us a if you have a digital version of it I can print it off and add it to it I can get it, well I'll get it cataloged first and then get it processed and then add it to the collection um, and then Hopefully, if you're okay with it, send a copy to archives as well. Um, or you can send us a physical copy through the mail or drop it off or just email us and say like, hey, how do I do this? And I will tell you all of that in an email. <laughs> and there are scanners sprinkled kind of throughout the, um, the library. One of our sort of next phases is to build some kind of map that will give sort of aspiring zinesters uh, access to, I mean, all this information is, of course, on the library website already, just if we can collate it to be kind of like the person with the zine eye glasses on to see the library and uh, the spaces that help you kind of further do this kind of craft. Thank you. And, yeah, and we hope to have some sort of workshops in the library too, um, as we get going, um, just kind of open workshops around certain times, like maybe around final as a way to kind of de-stress. Maybe we'll just have a table of making. We're still kind of ironing that out since we're just launching the program. 
Well, it's a, such a wonderful um, resource. I mean, we we would have loved to host a station um, in the museum, uh, but you know, having rubber stamps and like loaned objects just they don't work well together. So we and glue, we yeah, <laughs> dropped that idea pretty pretty quickly. Um, we had a question from Robin. Um, if you have any examples of students who have turned their or adapted their PhD or master's research thesis into zines. A thesis I don't have. Um, I have class assignments. Um, I don't think I have any. I mean, we have the art assignment where it was actually for art and they were to make a broadside and then um, made that into that one sheet folded thing. Um, but I have seen through my zine librarian kind of uh, interest group, um, international interest group, there's a bunch of librarians who curate and archivists and um, we call them barefoot librarians who aren't, who, who kind of might manage a zine library or archive in like a standalone thing in a collective or an info shop. Uh, we get together and and talk to each other and how how we can actually help each other teaching with zines. Um, but I've seen people use instead of handing in a one page paper uh, or like a lab report or doing field notes using a zine for that. Um, and right if you're thinking about doing a lab report you have its text and images so it kind of lends itself to a physical zine. Um, I've helped people, uh, a faculty member at another institution do an electronic zine um, and kind of thinking about how can we use the um, practices of physical, of, of tangible zine making, but make that for the digital realm. Like, so then you can include animated um, images and flashing and color changes and, and, and using the digital realm, but still thinking about the kind of the zine ethos and, and an artistic kind of um, way of making zines in the digital realm. So that, that was pretty interesting. Yeah. But feces, I don't know, that seems really jagged. That seems huge. That's like a book. <laughs> so maybe if you did like a chapter or if there's something, you know, smaller, maybe. We don't have any, at least in the archives, we don't have any Yukon student examples, but in the sort of more political focused zines, there are extremely academic topics written in sort of paper length form that are then condensed into the half page. And, you know, it, it basically comes from the tradition of pamphleting, right? The sort of early 20th century way of getting across political ideas through typically communist socialist related pamphlets um, is this very passable, you know, piece of writing that can be stored, it can be kept, it can be sort of held closely um, and not disclosed often as well. So the ability to like pass ideas uh, around in that format has been happening for a very long time. Um, and some folks use the zine in that very same way up to the present. It's a little more, um, uh, what's the word sort of you know, as soon as you open that first page, you're like, okay, I'm in for a real uh, reading session here. But if that's what you're looking for, the format lends itself to that historically for sure. We have, we do have a lot of zines. Uh, well, I have one series of zines that's like, <laughs> it's funny, it's like fan fiction almost. It's like for Sherlock, the Sherlock TV series, but there's this zine that and that they have like each issue has a specific theme um but it's also they have very academic and researched um articles in there along with some uh creative writing lessons and some just sort of other things but there are definitely like actual like academic worthy um studies in these and it's a very very thick thick zine and it was freely available yeah, that was very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I sort of love this idea of of this, you know, kind of return to the analog. I mean, you're 
talking about, um, you know, there being digital examples, but, um, you know, it's something that, that we've been thinking about a lot, um, you know, with, with the exhibition at the Benton, um, this kind of culture of just having things that are tangible that you can, that are sort of all around you and you pick them up and carry them around and collect them like posters, you know, all this ephemera um, and how a lot of that, you know, if you think of the experience of current students, you know, their world is certainly really different from, you know, my college world of like the late 90s um, and and sort of how all that, you know, kind of works. Um, but it just seems like there are some things and some ways of, especially like transmitting information. I mean, Graham, I wanted to like circle back around too to that connection with like social media. Um, you know, it, I mean, it's just really exciting to kind of have this as a um, something that people can can experience and maybe think about ways to, you know, sort of, um, I don't know, promote and carry forward in, in a way, like let's bring back paper. Um. Yeah, I think and a colleague of mine brought up recently that it, it's that having that tangible kind of, it is, that it is a social media because you are trading it, but it's a tangible social media, right? But you kind of, you can do it without fear of being trolled because nobody's going to, I mean, unless, you know, they write to you or whatever, but not as scarily as it is now in, in online social media, right? Um, and it's sort of, it's the whole concept of trading zines is that you're, you're, you're creating that community with each other and learning from each other and, and sharing your creative um, creation. And maybe course. discovering things too, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the unlabeled mixtape. Uh, I was talking to somebody about that the other day and like it take, takes you a really long time to figure out like what those songs were. But. Right, <laughs> totally. <laughs> and of course, no surprise to like the three of us, but like building a collection of zines that you have, you know, like just, just that idea of what are the things that you carry with you? What are the things that you can kind of like go back to and reflect on a time in your life, what have you. Um, backing up your phone is one way to do it, but nowhere near as cool as going back to like the physical collection of stuff that you've got. That's, I think, a, a really nice place maybe to conclude. Um, so I, I want to Thank both of you again uh, so much. Um, and also thank you to Yukon Library and Archives and Special Collections for um, co-sponsoring this event. Um, thanks to everybody who logged on and uh, hope to see you at the library. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you for having us.